I just want to check, uh, so you're all comfortable now downloading the slides from the website ahead of time, if you know where to find them. Yep. Uh, so as I mentioned in the first class, the expectation is I'll post the slides, uh, find the class, and uh, download them, please print them out and bring them to the, the class. You don't have to write down everything I have on the projector here. Um, I will, though, supplement what's on the projector with uh, board writing from time to time and switch between the two. So uh, print out the slides with some space to add extra notes in and that way we can get a full set of notes by the end of the week. Um, just a word on the slides. As I mentioned, I, I'm using Dr. Nashka's slides. Uh, I've taught this course for many years already. And so I've taken them, I've made some changes to his notes that I've done. My style is uh, words that are in purple color um, are definitions. And the color below it, I guess, is pink. But it's a beautiful color that the software that I use choose I don't have to pick it. It's uh, supposed to be a hyperlink. So if you see that, that brighter color in your notes or on, on the projector here, on the electronic PDF, you can click on it and go to a website that I usually give a bit more information on. So it's often a computer site or a YouTube site that shows a video of a reactor in action um, or, or something that supplements the material. And then I use other colors throughout the slides to emphasize. Also, just regarding version numbering, one thing that happens in my slides is that I update them pretty much day to day. So you may have the version downloaded, um, and then I've uploaded the new version to the website maybe a couple of hours later. One way you can always tell which version you have versus what I have is on this very front page, right at the bottom there is the revision number. So this is version 10, you may have version 9 for example. Don't worry too much if you've got one, one or two versions out of sync. Often the version number changes just because I think the spelling or the and a bigger version. So it's usually not a big one or two versions. That number will always just go up. It will write down to 10 by the end of this course, it will be around about 150. Also, regarding the final names, uh, today's class is class 01B. It's the first week of the term, the second uh, class of the week. Uh, so there'll be 1A, which was yesterday, uh, or 01B, 1C, 2A, 2B, etc. We'll get up to, I think, this semester we have uh, 13 weeks, so we'll get up to about 13 weeks right now. Just so that you know what, um, when the, what the PDF matches with the class. And I will leave that numbering as well in the course videos. So if you want to look back at the course videos and you want to find a specific video for this day, you look for 1B. Um, and that way you can, you can search uh, faster to get to where you want. Okay, so let's take a look at, at this evening's topic. This evening we're going to introduce some fundamental equations that we're going to use throughout the term. So it's important that the material we cover tonight, while it seems very straightforward, it's simply just a mole balance, something that you're very comfortable with in the 2D and 2D classes. It seems straightforward, but it is important to understand exactly what's going on in every term that equation is. We're going to then use that and build on it in the next few weeks. Now, the principle we're following here with reactive design is to relate mathematical models of a reactor. And to do that, we have and should have the following in your mind. For a general reactor, we'll specify this later. So this is it. General reactants inputs. So these are reactants we're adding to, to the system, and we have outputs as well that we want to get from it. So that's the general the general picture you should have in your head. There's inputs and outputs. And we'll characterize these inputs by certain reactants we add and their composition. And the outputs will have certain products and their composition as well. This reactor, I haven't specified what it is. We will learn about a few in the next uh, few classes. We'll learn about batch reactors, continuous reactors, packed bed, tubular bed, uh, tubular reactors, or plug flow reactors. So what we can call this, these, this type of reactor, we'll call this the contacting pattern. It's the way that we contact or bring the reactants together. So one thing to remember here is then our contacting pattern is something we need to specify. And we can choose that. We can pick which type of reactor we would like. So, for example, contacting 
had we could choose to use a batch reactor, or we could choose to use a plug flow reactor, also known as a tubular reactor, or we could pick a packed bed, or the usual reactor that we often use and study in these courses was CSTR, continuously stirred tank reactor. So contacting pattern is a characteristic of this block up here. One other characteristic that we need to be aware of is, let's just lump this under the general term and call it kinetics. So the kinetics tell us how fast or how slow things are going on inside that reactor. So if it's very fast, all we have to do is then resort to the chemical equilibrium equation of the reaction. Since the reaction is extremely quickly, it will achieve equilibrium and land up at equilibrium pretty quick. So we don't have to worry too much about the kinetics. But in many cases, if we don't have very fast, we have to use the reaction rate. So if not, we'll use the reaction rate. And that's what we're going to cover this evening, is this reaction rate. So to bear in mind that what essentially this entire course is about is relating the inputs, the contacting pattern, and the kinetics to the output. And we can write it mathematically the outputs are going to be some function of what we put into the reactor, how we contact those inputs, and the chemistry that those reactants have with each other. So let's lump that in to a single word for chemistry. So we're going to be building mathematical models that relate this input contacting pattern and kinetics and give us a prediction of the output. So we're looking to predict this output. From the other information that we have. So we usually know what inputs we're putting into the system. We know the concentrations, we know the flow rate, the temperature of that input. We have some freedom to choose that and specify that as engineers. We may have some constraints. We may be required to use a certain reactant with a given purity and concentration. But we can usually choose the temperature and the flow rate that we put that material into our reactor at. If we've got the luxury that we can design this reactor totally from scratch, we can pick if we're going to use a batch reactor, a plug flow, CSTR. If we're constrained to use an existing reactor, we're maybe reusing an old vessel or an old piece of equipment that's in our company already, we may have that choice already made up to us. Different reactors will lead to different outputs. So some reactors will be more optimal, get higher conversion perhaps, or improved outputs that are desirable. So the choice of reactor is an important aspect as well. The kinetics, can we do anything about the kinetics? Yeah, how? We can increase the temperature. We can increase the temperature. Anything else we can do to change the kinetics? Another catalyst. Pick a different catalyst, yeah. Yeah, catalyst. Anything else? Okay, so the pressure at which we operate the system, if it's a gas-based system, the pressure. Pressure is another way of saying we're changing the concentration. So kinetics can easily be influenced with two main variables that we'll deal with, at least initially. One is temperature, the other is concentration. Or if it's a gas-based system, we'll, we'll call it pressure. Okay, so for gas-based systems, pressure is equal to the concentration times the gas constant, R, times the temperature. So CA or PA really are equivalent ways of saying the same thing. So kinetics can be influenced 
Contacting pads can be chosen, inputs can be adjusted and chosen, or at least changed in some way. Okay. So very important to understand is we've got a lot of degrees of freedom. Yeah, we've got a lot of choices, in other words. It's the same, same thing. We've got a lot of degrees of freedom, we've got a lot of choices on how to adjust that output. And adjusting that output is, is critical because at the end of the day, that's going to answer the question, how well are we doing? And when I say that, I usually mean dollars. So what are the economics here? If we're going to generate a product that's got high levels of impurities, that product is not very valuable to sell. Or if we've got a high level of impurities, we're going to have to spend additional money installing separation processes like distillation columns after this reactor to clean up the products coming out of the reactor. Okay, so how well we are doing drives the economics, drives the success, drives the salary, and drives the profitability of the process. So we can, we can influence that in a number of ways. <coughs> And so that's, that's where we're heading. That's what we're going to learn here. We're going to learn this evening a bit, recap about rates of reaction, mole balances. And then in the next few classes, we're going to look at how we apply that to these different reactor types or contacting patterns. So the first thing to recap then is rate of reaction. This is something you're comfortable with from your chemistry courses, but let's, uh, let's be clear here. We're going to say a reaction has occurred when a species changes its appearance or its identity. Okay, so there's several ways in which we can do that. We can take a species A and we can decompose it into products B and C. So we change the identity of A by decomposing it into a species B and C. Another way that we can have a reaction occur is if we're combining materials. So combining A with B leads to product C. This is the classical reactor equation that we often use. But decomposition is equally valid. And then another one that we, we can use is isomerization. So we're simply taking one form of the chemical species and isomerizing it into another. So it would be correct to say A goes to B here in this case, except really it's A going to another form of A. Okay, so there is a, a, just here's an illustration of that, that color, there's a link. This is a definition. So the definition here is the important part. Rate of reaction, we're going to express them as the rate of formation of products. So it's, the key is here, formation of products. How fast are we producing these products? That's why I mentioned kinetics up here. Are we able to produce these products extremely rapidly, in which case we're only going to be constrained by the equilibrium constant of this chemical reaction, or if the reaction rate is very slow, typical of biological reactions, for example, biological reactions, your body um, works at a very slow reaction rate. So these bio, bio processes have low reaction rate constants. So let's be a bit more concrete then, we'll define the reaction rate for a species J, so the subscript J, is defined as the rate of formation of that species J per unit volume. Okay, very clear yet per unit volume that we're, that we're going to be talking about. And I will use these terms interchangeably. Formation is the same as generation. So the rate of generation, the rate of formation means the same thing. Rate of creation um, of, of so let's take this combination reaction, A plus B going to C and D. R subscript A then, by definition, is the rate at which we're forming A. So it's the A, the number of moles of species A, being formed per unit time per unit volume. Okay, so a rate is always implicit as time per unit time, so it's A per unit time per unit volume. And the units of that are moles per unit time, so moles per second, the rate per unit volume. The volume, most typically, we'll use liters or meters cubed. But you should be comfortable working with uh, American units as well. 
Okay, so in this case, let's just clear up one issue here. Since the definition of the rate is with respect to formation, A, however, is on the left-hand side of that equation. We're not forming A. We're actually consuming A. So in this case, that rate is negative. So very key here with reaction rates is that the sign is important. Ra, the rate at which we're forming A, is negative in this case because we're really not forming it, we're consuming it. So the negative of formation is consumption. So we're going to consider Ra, if I write it just as that, Ra will be a negative value. What is Rb? And negative value as well. Anything else you can say about Rb? You're the same as Ra. You're the same as well. Yeah. Rc? Positive value and equal to Ra. Okay, Rd the same. Okay, so let's then consider this definition just using these words now, disappeared and consumed being the same thing, the rate of consumption or the rate of disappearance, let's call negative RA, so take that usual positive quantity RA, as in this case RA is a negative value, put a negative in front of it, the negative times the negative gets you a positive quantity, now that's the number of moles of A disappearing, or moles of A can be consumed per unit time per unit volume. So negative RA in this instance is a positive quantity. So we're going to use this convention of minus RA all the time. So you must be comfortable with what that negative sign means and, and what its convention is. And very key is that the interpretation is minus RA is the rate of disappearance or rate of consumption. One thing that's key here is to be able to convert the equations we see in the text and in the notes to language that you can talk with one-on-one -on -one to your colleagues, to your boss, to your manager. So you can convey the scientific notation in plain English to someone else. So minus RA, the rate at which we're consuming or using up reactants A. So one thing, let's just do a quick thermodynamics recall here. Reaction rate is an intensive property. Okay, so definition here, an intensive property is a property which only depends on that property on, of the system itself, for example, concentration and temperature, but is not dependent on the size of the system, or the configuration of the system, or the extent of the system. It's an intensive property, independent of, of volume, independent of size. So let's just make that distinction here. We've got intensive, and then the opposite of it is extensive. So an extensive property is a property that does depend on the size of the system. So an example of an extensive property is mass. The mass of the system is very much dependent on the size of the system. Maybe another intensive property. Is volume intensive? Maybe an intensive property. Density. Anything else? Molar volume. So what do you mean by molar volume? Um, moles per volume. Moles per volume. Moles per volume. Yeah. That's a, that's related to density. Uh, mass flow rate. So mass flow rate is in which units? Per hour, per yeah, unit time. So would that be a function of time uh, of, of of the system itself? Flow rate. It's a mass per unit time, so it would be an extensive property. Are there other intensive properties? This temperature. That's a good one. Anything else that you can think of? Sorry? Pressure. pressure of the system. Does it depend on the size of the system? No. So pressure.
Viscosity would be which type? Intensive. How about entropy? Extensive. So the larger the system, the more entropy it has. Energy, internal energy. Extensive. Heat capacity. Intensive. So one rule of thumb is if you want to take um, an extensive property, so for example, let's put a few up here that I just mentioned, mass, energy, extensive or intensive? Per volume. So it depends on volume. No? So concentration is an intensive property. I'll talk about that one in a minute. Number of moles in the system, that's clearly an extensive property. The more moles, the bit the so the larger the system, the more moles. Velocity. Intensive, extensive. Intensive. So you've got the idea now. So uh, entropy. One rule that you can use is if you take the extensive property and you divide it through by the extent of the system, you get an intensive property. So to go from extensive to intensive, divide by the system's extent. By that I mean, for example, if I take the number of moles and I divide it through by the volume of the system, the extent of that system, I'm going to get moles per unit volume, i.e. concentration, and I land up with an intensive property. So reaction rate is exactly that. Reaction rate is, let's just go back to that definition, the rate of formation of the species, represented in moles per second, so the rate, moles per second, per unit volume. Dividing it through by the volume makes that now an intensive property. So it's the fact that I divide it through by the volume is what's causing and creating an intensive property over there. Okay, so this is just a, that's a recap of something that you would have learned in thermodynamics. Now, we like intensive properties a lot as engineers. We really like them because we don't have to worry about the scale of the system. If I know the reaction rate, I know that applies whether the system is this big or whether it's a cellular level. So that's, that reaction rate will hold no matter where I'm dealing with it. If I'm putting it into a batch reactor, a plug flow reactor, a tubular reactor, CSTR, doesn't matter. It doesn't depend on the reactor's configuration. Okay? It's not a function of the configuration of the reactor, it's not a function of the size of the reactor. So we really like intensive properties because we can use them everywhere. Okay, any doubts, any questions on, on that? Yeah. How, would you, how would you categorize a ratio, like the Reynolds number? The Reynolds number, can you talk about the Reynolds number of this pen flying through the room? Does it have a diameter? It's flowing through a fluid of a certain viscosity. It has a Reynolds number. For sure it does. If I throw, if I move a particle through a fluid, and so if the fluid here is air, there's a Reynolds number associated with this object. Is that Reynolds number a function of the object's size? If I make it a bigger, if I make it a bigger object, the extent of the system gets bigger. Okay, so Reynolds number is rho dp divided by mu. So rho d, sorry, not rho dp. So it's the velocity at which I'm throwing that object. Is that a function of the, of the object? Velocity, intensive or extensive property? Intensive property. Okay, so velocity can go here, there it is. D, diameter, definitely a function of the extent of the object. Rho, the density, intensive property, not a function of the object. Mu, a function of the fluid that it's in, so it's not really a function of the object as well. Okay, so yes, I would say the Reynolds number is, a, is, a, uh, is dependent on the size of the, the object, so it's going to be an extensive property. So we need this number in general, like Schmidt number and Edgar number, we have to just, they can be either extensive or intensive depending on how they're defined? 
Yeah, I would, I, I would say so. I haven't really thought through it and looked it up myself. But if I had to think through the logic and the definition of what an intensive and extensive property is, that's the conclusion I would come to. Okay, so this is the reasoning I want you to have. Like when we're thinking about topics like this, don't just take the, the <coughs> definition here and add a value like this. Think about it. Think of the, the system under different conditions, how it would, how you can get to that property or how you can interpret that property under different situations. Okay, so let's then take a look now. We've already mentioned this really uh, earlier on. We said, what well, can we affect RA? So uh, we're talking about this term in that function. Okay, so we're going to talk in the next few classes about the contacting pattern. That will come up later. Inputs, let's assume for now these are fixed. So let's assume we've been given some reactants at a given temperature, at a given flow. Uh, your boss has told you we need to put through this much reactants at this flow rate, and it's available at 25 degrees C. So we're, we're assuming for now our inputs are fixed or given to us. Our contacting pattern, we'll look at it in the next few days. We're now just going to talk about kinetics for now. The kinetics then, we can influence the temperature and the concentration, we've said already, as two ways we can influence it. The pressure, if we're dealing with the gas system, is really just another way of saying we're adjusting the concentration. So that comes from the fact that the pressure and the concentration are related to each other through this PA, or species A, is equal to the concentration of A times the gas constant in RT. So Either we specify PA or CA, um, we can get one or the other. And then the final way we can influence the rate is by choosing a different catalyst. Okay, or we can add more catalysts, add more catalytic sites, and that can enhance the reaction rate. We won't actually deal with catalysis in this particular course too much. There used to be a course offered 4K, which dealt with catalysis and heterogeneous reaction systems, uh, but that's, that course is not offered um, right now. So. In 3K, introduction to reactor design, we, we don't deal with catalysis for, for the moment. But if there's a bit of time at the end, though, I will introduce the topic because I think it is important to, to at least see some of it before you graduate. Okay, so let's focus on those first two then, temperature or concentration. Conveniently, the rate expression breaks these down for us in two separate parts. We've all seen rate expressions of this form. So you may, may or may not recall from chemistry the reaction rate times the rate constant times the concentration, Ca. That's a very simple reaction rate. Minus Ra is equal to the rate constant times the concentration term. So the rate constant, Ka or K, that's a function of temperature. There's that Arrhenius term, the activation energy, you'll recall those terms from from the chemistry courses. We'll look at those in the next few days. Then there's the term here in the second bracket that represents the effect of concentration. So both of those come together in, in the product to affect the rate. So this just comes, this slide here just talks a little bit um, about the intensive property of the reaction rate. Um, Prashant had this in his slides and I thought this was a good example. If a bank lends you money at 5%, so um, I, when I got the mortgage on my house, the bank rate was 4.4% years ago. If I was going to buy a house that was, say, $200,000, the mortgage that the bank gives me, that rate is 4.4%. If I was wealthy enough to purchase a house of $5 million, the interest rate is still 4.4%. It doesn't matter how much money you want from the bank, the interest rate that they charge you to lend that money to you is the same value, percentage-wise, doesn't change. So the bank's interest rate is independent of the amount of money that they will lend you. For the vast majority of cases, especially for mortgages. Mortgages, no matter how cheap or how, how, how expensive your house, it's the same rate for everyone. Reaction rates are the same idea. The amount of reaction occurring is dependent on the volume of the system. No, the reaction rate is independent of the volume. It's an intensive property because we've divided through that by the volume. 
but the number of moles per unit volume does affect the concentration. So the number of moles per unit volume is this idea over here. So the number of moles, which is an inextensive property, divided through by the volume, gets me a concentration. Concentration is an intensive property. So this number of moles per unit volume, which determines concentration, concentration then goes and affects the rate. So that's that's something that, that is important to understand, is that relationship there from the number of moles in the system. Number of moles clearly is an extensive property. If I've got three moles or 25 moles, it's an extent of the system. But per, once I go to a per unit volume basis, I'm now in an intensive, intensive equation or intensive property that's not going to, um, to change depending on the scale of my system. So these concepts of intensive, extensive, concentration and rates are, are basic chemistry concepts that I just want to make sure we're all up to speed before we go off. So let's take a look then at a few rate expressions. One of the simplest ones is this one I have up on the board here already. The rate is proportional to the concentration. So that's simply another way of saying in English what's up there mathematically. The rate is proportional to the concentration where that constant of proportionality is lowercase k. Or the rate of reaction is proportional to the square of the concentration. Or the rate of reaction is proportional to a complex function of the concentration. This particular form over here is very common in bioreaction systems. So the bioreaction system we get fairly complex rate expressions occur. This rate of reaction here, the fact that it's raised to the square means that if I've got a very high concentration of A in my system, I'm going to get a very rapid reaction occurring, depending on what that constant proportionality is. Okay, so if I have the same lowercase k value here in these two instances, this reaction down here is going to proceed at a much faster rate. The rate of consumption of A is going to be much faster than if this were the rate expression, for, this, for a given k, for the same k value. Now, how do we determine these k's, k1, k2, or just the regular k over there? We're going to look at that in a few weeks from now in the course. We're going to look at how we collect rate data, how we run, expression, uh, run experiments that will get those rate constants for us. So if I don't really know how my system's reaction really looks, let me say I postulate or I hypothesize or I guess, whatever you want to call it, trial and error. You guess that the reaction rate expression is of the form K multiplied by the concentration raised to some power N. But I don't know what lowercase K is. I don't know what lowercase N is. I can determine that though from running a specific set of experiments that will identify those values for me. And I can then go ahead and compute those two. So we'll, we'll get to that in a few weeks' time in the course, and, and I'll show you how to do that effectively. So for now, though, in many of your exercises, that information will be given to you. OK, let's move on then and talk about the general mole balance equation. This is an equation that's going to reoccur through the next few classes as we look at different contacting patterns. So what we're going to look at is we're going to derive this equation for a general system. I'm not going to specify the equation. This is a vanish reactor, a plug flow reactor. It's just a generic system that's shown by this ugly shape up here. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a mole balance for a given species J. So only for one of the species, we're going to do a mole balance at a particular instant in time. So freeze time for a minute, let's do a mole balance. There's a certain flow of that species into that system in moles per second. So Fj0 is the flow rate of species J into the system moles per second. Flow out of the boundary Fj, moles leaving of species J per unit time. Inside this boundary, there's a given number of moles, Nj. So the general equation there, it's a mole balance, let's be clear, it's not a mass balance. 
Okay? We do not do mass balances in this course. We're going to be dealing with mole balances. We'll talk about why that is in a few classes or in the class of two from now. We're dealing with the mole balance only. We're going to take in plus generated minus out, and that's whatever's left over then is accumulated in the system. Okay, so moles coming in, moles leaving. We're going to generate moles. Okay, so this is why it's not a mass balance. Mass balances, we don't generate and consume mass. Mass balances, we have in and out of accumulation. But for a mole balance, absolutely, we can generate species inside that boundary. Rate of generation of J by chemical reaction within the system, moles per unit time, is then we'll call this G of J, and G of J moles per unit time. Every term here has the same units, moles of time of the rate flowing in, moles per unit time, the rate is regenerating, leaving, and then whatever is left over is the moles per unit time remaining in the boundary. So let's just talk about this term over here, the moles of material J remaining in the boundary is dNj by dt. The rate of change of the material per unit time accumulating in the boundary. So if that system is at steady state, dNj by dt is zero. The system at steady state by definition means it's not changing with time. So dTs are zero. Rate of flow out, we've defined that term in our diagram, fj, so minus fj. Rate flowing in is F subscript J0. Let's now talk about this last term here, the generator. The number of moles generated of species A, or of species J per unit time, we can then get that from our rate expression. So if we take our rate, Rj, which remember was moles per time per unit volume, Rj Remember, I had units of moles per second per liter, or moles per second per meter cubed. By definition, reaction rate is this extensive property, a function of the volume, divided through by the volume, I should say. So reaction rate divided through by the volume. By multiplying through the volume, we get and recover then moles per unit time. So moles per unit time per unit volume, the reaction rate, multiplied by the volume of the system we're dealing with, V gets us our G of G. Now, a, a, a complete mole balance would have a consumed term as well. In minus out plus generated minus consumed is equal to the accumulation term. So that's the usual form that you've seen in, in the previous course. Why are we not using a consumed term? Guesses. Why don't I have a term, a negative, for what's consumed in that boundary? Um, okay. term here because we're saying our generated term takes care of whether it's generated or consumed. If it's consumed, the generated term will just be a negative value. Okay, so generation, the opposite of generation is consumption or the opposite of formation. So we simply use the sign of G to take care of the fact whether the species is being generated or whether it's being consumed. Okay, so for now, we won't, we won't see a consumed term in there because it really is just taken care of by the generator. <coughs> Next, then, we can look at this small that volume, and we can divide it into small regions. So here I've got an arbitrary uh, volume as shown here by this diagram. If I take this volume now and I divide it through into small regions, and make the assumption then that within each region, I choose those small sub-volumes to be small enough so that all variables are constant within that tiny volume, or that small sub-volume, I can essentially write that same expression. G is equal to R times the volume, but I'm writing this now except for every small sub-volume. So for a small volume, delta V multiplied by the reaction rates that occurs in that sub-volume, 
Remember, reaction rate is an intensive property. It doesn't depend on the volume. So I've got this reaction rate occurring multiplied by the small subvolumes volume. That's going to get me the amount of G that's being generated. So the incremental amount of G that I'm creating, the rate of generation within that subvolume. And I can take all those small subvolumes and add them up. So I take that big volume, divide it into M smaller regions. If I sum over the small, those M small regions, I can get the total amount generated. So capital GJ is the total amount generated is equal to delta GJ for the I subvolume. So I is equal to 1, I is equal to 2, 3, 4, up to capital M. So, uh, expanding that term then, that's the rate for species J in the I volume multiplied by delta DI. And the reason why we've gone to this, these sets of deltas really is the moment you see this, you know that there's going to be an integral coming up. Delta VI and M, the number of subvolumes are chosen to go to infinity. That would imply also that the volume sizes goes to zero. And we can rewrite that then as the integral over the entire volume is the reaction rate times dv. So that g of j term then, that reaction rate of, uh, sorry, the g of j, the, the amount generated in the null balance, I'm not given that. I need to, to get it from some, some way. Well, I've got fj0, I know my flow in, I know my flow out. nj is going to be whatever's left over. I need to specify g of j in some way. And this sub-volume concept allows me to get to that. So g of j, the total amount of j generated in moles per unit time then is this integral over the entire volume. And this is then equation 1-4 in the course notes, in the course textbook folder. Okay, so when you see these equation numbers, they don't refer to the notes, they refer to the textbook equation numbers. So if you want to read up a bit more about the derivation, maybe you quite, didn't quite understand why uh, I just explained it, please feel free to go look up equation 1-4 in both of the other textbooks, in the new one or the old one. Where they differ, I will put two numbers. If, they, if I only give one equation number, it's the same one. OK, so let's just take a look here. Rj, then, is the reaction rate. And I haven't taken it out of the integral. Okay. Rj, I've left inside the integral. We're integrating over the entire volume. But I've said here, we cannot take Rj term out of the integral. So I, I, in general, I cannot write the following. I cannot write G of J. So I cannot write that is equal to Rj times the integral dB over the entire volume dB. Doing so implies that Rj is not a function of the volume. If I write that, it implies that Rj is independent of the volume and can be taken out of the integral. But I said to you earlier in the class, the reaction rate is independent of the volume. It's an intensive property. If you look back at those earlier slides, I said it's an intensive property, not a function of the size of the system, not a function of the volume. Now I'm telling you, we cannot take Rj out of the integral. Okay, Rj is a function of the size of the volume scale of the system. What's going on here? Moles per unit per volume. volume. That's one way you can interpret it. The way to, or one thing you need to recognize in the derivation we looked at here earlier in the subvolume is this little RJI here, that's the reaction rate in the small subvolume of volume delta V subscript I. That's assumed to be constant because that small subvolume has constant properties. If there's the same concentration, the same temperature, the same environment exists in that very small subvolume. In general, 
for a large reactor, the properties are not constant throughout the reactor. So in this diagram, in this, in this photograph that I showed in the, in the first class, this is a large CSTR. The concentration at one point over here and the temperature, for example, the temperature is different in different parts of this reaction system. For a very well mixed reactor, the temperatures are going to be the same. But if I have poor mixing in there, or there's dead spots in the reactor that don't get well mixed, the temperature, the concentration, some of these properties listed up here are going to change and be different at different locations in the reactor. Okay. That means then that the reaction rates in different parts of the reactor are different. So for a very large reactor with dead spots, one way to see that is if I take a very poorly designed reactor with square corners and no baffles, and I have a mixer up here, it's going to mix very well in the upper regions, but there's going to be dead spots here in these corners where this material down here doesn't get contacted as well as the material in the rest of the reactor. So the temperature, the concentration at these regions in the reactor are not going to be the same. This temperature up here is not going to be the same as the temperature down there. So for that reason, we cannot integrate, uh, cannot take Rj outside the integral unless we make the assumption that the entire reactor conditions are homogeneous or the same. So unless we make that assumption, we have to leave Rj inside the integral. Okay, so we're going to see a few reactors in the next few classes where that reaction rate is constant everywhere in the reaction, and that means we can take it out. We're also going to see reactor systems where it's not true. The most obvious one is a plug flow reactor or the tubular reactor, which is essentially just a big pipe that's very long. And material flows in over here, so I'm putting in my reactants A and B, and as this material flows through the pipe, it's reacting. As it's reacting, it's releasing energy. As it's releasing energy, there's temperature. Temperature is changing through time and through distance along this reactor. Coming out here, I'm going to get A, B unreacted, C and D as products, for example. So at different points along this reactor, I'm going to get different concentrations, different temperatures. The conditions inside that tubular reactor are not constant throughout the volume. So here, capital B, the volume of that reactor, I cannot assume that the reaction rate Rj is constant throughout the entire volume that I'm integrating over. So if my integral is over the entire volume, the conditions are not, not constant. So a good example of this is the low density polyethylene reactor system. That reactor tube is about two, three kilometers long. Okay, the only, that's, that's how those these systems are, are operated in practice. It's essentially just a long tube that coils and coils and coils around, and they run A and B in, and they get A, B, C, and D out. And there's good temperature control of the long end reactor. But across those three kilometers, it's definitely clear that what's going in at the beginning is very different to what's coming out. So we cannot make an assumption. Okay. So that's the, that's the key concepts you need to get from this evening's class. We're going to use this general reaction equation, G of J, to define my amount of material created or generated is the integral over the volume. And then we're going to substitute that into the general mole balance and we're going to look at various reactor types in the class tomorrow.